Good morning to worship at St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Hopkins, Michigan, to those gathered here, as well as those who are gathered wherever you are out there. I'd like to welcome you to the, the worship of the Triune God, in which, through His means of grace, His Holy Spirit will bless you uh, with blessings. And our theme for today, for those of you who have your bulletin, you know that. Um, those of you who don't have your bulletin, it is this, that in revealing His saving work for us in Christ, God moves us to obey Him and declare His praises before the world. Let's join in worship together. We will follow the order of worship as found on page 38 and following, service of the Word. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore we need to confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. The best news in all the world is this, that God our Heavenly Father has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Savior Jesus Christ, He has removed your sin and its guilt from you forever. The result is that you are a perfect, blood-washed child of God. May God now give to each of us the strength to live according to His will. Amen. We bow our heads for the column for the day. <coughs> o God, protector of all the faithful, you alone make strong. You alone make holy. Show us your mercy and forgive our sins day by day. Guide us through our earthly <coughs> lives that we do not lose the things you have prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Here ends our first lesson. Our worship continues with the psalm of the day. The psalm is Psalm 100. You'll find that psalm printed for you, page 104 in the front portion of Christian worship. Let's, let's respond in unison the words of the psalm, ignoring the refrain, but joining in joyfully the glory of Patrick. <laughs> Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue with our second lesson, recorded for us by the pen of St. Paul, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. The inspired apostle revealed that while we were still powerless, ungodly sinners, and about the worst description you and I can give of us as, as God's enemies, hated ones, Christ died for us, and he reconciled us to God. That was the hard part. If God's love paid such a high price to declare us holy, is it any trouble for him to save us from the coming wrath and to bring us to the enjoyment of eternal life? Not hard for him. We turn our attention to the second lesson. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here ends our second lesson. May your priests be clothed with righteousness. May your saints sing for joy. We continue with the third lesson. The gospel reading is recorded in, in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning at verse 35, and then continue into chapter 10, including at verse 8. Jesus had compassion, the, the, uh, the splotata, um, that gut compassion, that inner compassion, that inner mercy on the crowds who were before him harassed and helpless. They were like, as he said, sheep without shepherd. His solution was twofold. His disciples are to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, so they're to pray that the Lord will provide workers. And then they are called to be those workers, to go, especially to the lost sheep of Israel. The scope, the power of the message, and all things are provided by the one who called his disciples into his mission and kingdom. We turn our attention to Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
And he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the scary who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying. Give without pay. Here ends our gospel lesson. Our worship continues with the hymn of the day, hymn number 396, entitled, In Adam We Have All Been One. Received 
reconciliation. Let's talk. In the name of and to the glory of the God of free and faithful grace, as always and only, dear, dear blessed saints. If there was such a gauge, a meter that could read it, what would the level of joy read inside of your heart? What would your joy meter say? <coughs> Would it be towards the bottom, almost empty, the middle, perhaps maybe towards the top? If you're like me, we tend to get so busy with life, bogged down with the things in life, that you and I forget to enjoy the blessings that the Lord has given to us. My mom admonished me so many times, don't forget to smell the roses along the way. We do that, don't we? You and I know that when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost the image of God, and so did we, their descendants. We lost the image of God, and along with the righteousness and holiness that, that is that image of God, we also lost every reason for happiness. Now, and later on, all the time. But that's not the way things stayed, did it? The Holy Spirit sanctified us in the wide sense. And when he brought to us to faith in Jesus as Savior and put that new man inside of us, he also gave us a partial restoration of that new, new man, that, 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 old, that image of God inside of us. And along with righteousness and holiness, objectively given through Jesus' redemptive work and Father's decree of justification, you and I have been given blessings of Jesus' work for us in, in his life and resurrection. Blessings of forgiveness, peace, hope. I can see it on the catechism page in, in, uh, in that circle in the third article. And yes, even joy. You and I have been given the blessing of joy. So again, I ask you, what does your joy meter, the gauge inside of your heart, what is it reading? Is it reading empty, halfway, full? This morning, the words penned by the Apostle Paul to the Romans proclaimed to the Romans that they had reason. They had reason just like the Thessalonians did. And it was to the Thessalonians that the Apostle Paul wrote these words. He said, be joyful always. If you want to look that up, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 tells us, be joyful always. So as we take a look at the words of the Apostle Paul this morning to the Romans, I hope and pray that the reason that he gave to the Romans that they had to be joyful always, is a reason for you to be joyful always as well. Our verse begins with the words, not only is this so. What is so? What is so is what the Apostle Paul wrote in the previous verse, verse 10. Some of you know what is so. Because some of you actually heard a sermon on this a number of years ago. True, it was 15 years ago that I preached on Romans chapter 5, verse 10. But some of you will remember what is so. When Paul tells us, not only is this so. For those of you who don't remember that sermon, we're going to review what is so for you today. So let's take a look at verse 10 and see what Paul said is so. He said in verse 10, the previous verse, For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled even through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Paul told the Romans that they just couldn't be certain and sure 
that they were going to be saved, but they could be extra doubly certain and sure. How and why? Because of the grace and power and mercy of the Lord, Lord and Savior. He remedied two maladies that benefited them. And we have both of those negative maladies here mentioned that turned into positives for the Romans. And this is what is so. The first thing that's so is that the Romans were enemies of God. That really is about uh, as worse as you and I can get to be enemies of the just and holy God. And that's exactly what the Romans were. Yet, that's not what they stayed. That status was changed, wasn't it? And it was changed by the, the Son of God himself, Jesus the Christ. He said, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son. You see, Jesus, when he allowed sinful men to nail him to the cross, upon which he suffered and died, he, he paid for the, the sins that was the reason for the animosity and the hostility between us and that just and holy God. Jesus paid for the sins of the world. Jesus removed the sins from the Romans and from everybody in the world so that sins were no longer a reason for hostility and animosity between a just and holy God and mankind. Sin was done away with. Sin was removed. Jesus paid for it with his innocent suffering and death on the cross. Sin no longer was a problem between a just and holy God and mankind. In fact, the status not only changed from being enemies, but to actually being friends and family members of the Lord God. Talk about a change. Talk about going from negative to about as positive as you can get. Friends and family. And that's what could make them doubly certain that they would be saved in the long run. It's because they had been reconciled. The second negative malady that was, that was taken, taken away, removed, turning into a positive for them, was this. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? In order to reconcile the Romans and every, every man, woman, child, past, present, and future, Jesus had to suffer and die. There was no getting around that. And he did. We confess that, don't we? That he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was dead, and was buried. But he didn't stay dead, did he? If he would have stayed dead, then I would understand why the Romans could be a little bit anxious or worried about, are we really going to get there or not? Because a dead Savior can't help anybody. But Jesus rose on the third day. He rose from the dead. He's no longer dead. He's alive. And he lives to continue to, to assist the Romans and every one of his believers so that they will collect the reward of, uh, of, of that inheritance that he has earned for everyone. Jesus lives to, to help them. You remember that from that sermon back in 2005? I don't either. <clears throat> the only reason I know I preached on that is because I have records. I just looked it up and so um, 2005, I preached on Romans chapter 5 verse 10. That's the reason why you didn't get Romans 5 verse 10 today. You're getting Romans 5 verse 11, which I have never, ever preached on in my entire ministry. So, having been caught up with what the Apostle Paul says, not only is this so, let's go on to the, the point of the rest of the verse and see the point from verse 11, which is the verse before us this morning. This is verse 11 one more time. Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The Apostle Paul was not just satisfied that his parishioners, namely the Romans, 
had the knowledge of their reconciliation, as well as the fact that Jesus was no longer dead but living. He was not just satisfied that they knew that. Although, that's the good news, isn't it? Paul wanted more. And that's the reason why he went on to verse 11. Paul wanted the Romans not just to have this knowledge floating around in their head and more willing, spirit willing, inside their hearts. But he actually wanted them to take this knowledge and enjoy it. To let that knowledge bring them joy in their life. You see, that's the reason why he said this, this certainty and sh sureness of, of forgiveness of sins and eternal life is not something that you will have in the future. Reconciliation is not something that you can look forward to having one day. You have it right now. Reconciliation is something you possess right now. That's the reason why he said you, you, not, you won't, will have reconciliation, but we have now been reconciled through the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a blessing that you and I have now. This is the blessing that Paul wanted the Romans to be reminded. And with this reconciliation and a living Savior, they also had that new status right now that reconciliation gave them. They were no longer enemies like they had been. They were now and they were now friends and family. They had a new status, a changed status, thanks to Jesus. Yes, thanks to Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus was their friend. What a friend they had in Jesus. I think uh, every one of us knows that we're not living in heaven, right? We live in a veil of tears. All around us are the effects of sin. We have disasters, diseases, don't need to tell you that, disasters, diseases, divorces, discontentment, and death. And two, they don't start with D, stress and anxiety. All of these things are, are going on all around us, and if you and I focus on those, those bad things and the sad things, well, guess where our joy meter is going to be? Our gauge is going to read towards the bottom, right? Our gauge is going to go up and down, mostly down, like the barometer when the weather gets bad. You and I can get so caught up in the bad things of life that somebody once told me it's a lot like your noses get caught in Limburger cheese. And no matter if you're walking through a fragrant garden of roses, you're not going to smell the fragrance. Your, your nose is going to be stuck in that stink. And everything is going to be influenced and dominated by that stink. That stink of that Limburger cheese. And that's what bad things, sad things can do for you and for me if we focus on them. And that's the reason why you and I need to listen to Paul's words here this morning. And we need to hear... And remember that even though you and I have a zillion and trillion and how many numbers of reasons to be unhappy, sad, discontent, stressed, sorrowful, maybe even feel like we need to go out in the backyard and, and <coughs> eat worms because nobody likes us and maybe even tempted to, to give up. Even though we have all reasons to do all of that, you and I still have one reason, and we need to remember that reason, is that we've been reconciled to God through the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at what Jesus has done for us. He reconciled you and me with Him and the Holy Spirit and the Father, the triune God, so that you and I are no longer enemies, but we are friends and family. And that means that Jesus is our friend too, isn't it? Jesus has reconciled us, removed the, the problem between us and that holy God too. Sin is gone. It no longer separates us now or, or in eternity. And so now the scary situation of him being a, a scary judge is gone. Isn't it? He's still going to be a 
to judge. But we're going to be based, we're going to be judged on the basis of Jesus' righteousness, not, not our own unrighteousness or even righteousnesses. Yes, that scary idea of Jesus being a, a scary judge is gone. Instead, he's our friend. You know what that means? Jesus is our friend. Have you thought about the blessing of the gift of what a friend is? A real friend. I'm not talking about people who you think are friends, but the minute something comes along, they, they'll be behind ride. The gift of a true friend is really a, a, a really a, an amazing gift. What do real friends do? I'll give you a list of things that they do. A true friend will never expect from you more than you are able to give them. They're not going to complain about what you don't do for them. They are people who are going to forgive and keep on forgiving and keep on forgiving, and they don't keep track of how many times they've forgiven you. And that forgiveness will never end. A true friend is really somebody who has realized, knows, and has experienced the true forgiveness that Christ has given to them. And they are able to practice unending forgiveness, which means I haven't just forgiven you, I've forgotten what you did to me or to somebody else. That's what a true friend does. Forgets. A true friend is willing to go out of their way to benefit you, not just them. A true friend will never quit on you. Even if you question their integrity or do something that they will never ever quit on you. Because that's what a real friend does. And Jesus is that real friend. And you and I know. Look at what he's done for us. He went out of his way to benefit you. He came into this world to live for you and for me. To provide us with righteousness we couldn't ever earn on our own. He kept the law for you and for me. Look at what he went through on the cross. He suffered and died. Expiating his holy precious blood to cover your sins and mine. All of, all of that has got the stamp of approval of the Heavenly Father with that Easter victory on Easter Sunday morning. Yes, look at what Jesus has done for you. That's a true friend, isn't it? And that's what Jesus is. He is our friend. He's the best friend that you and I can ever have. That's the reason why, even though you may have all the reasons in the world to be unhappy, you still have one reason to do as the Apostle Paul told the Thessalonians. And the Romans, in, in other words, to be joyful always. Not some of the time, not most of the time, but to have your joy meter, your, the gauge of joy in your heart up there all the time. You have reason. I have reason. But we forget, don't we? Yeah, we're good Lutherans. Good Lutheran Christians. We know exactly how we have been saved. And we're, we're certain of that because it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Jesus. And so Jesus is our, our Savior. He is our, our complete Savior. He is our Savior alone. We emphasize that. Scripture emphasizes that. By grace alone, by faith alone, through Scripture alone, by Christ alone. Yes, we realize that Jesus has earned for us the forgiveness of sins and that because of Christ, we will get to go to heaven one day. That's an inheritance that he's given to us. That's not all he's done for us. Jesus just doesn't give us forgiveness and an inheritance in heaven. He has given to you and me blessings that you and I can enjoy right here and now. Blessings such as Forgiveness, peace, hope, and yes, joy. You and I have been given joy. <coughs> and we need to remember that. I hope and pray that you walk out this morning remembering that you've been given the blessing of joy. Because Jesus is your friend. Jesus is a real friend. He's your best friend. And he doesn't stay here. He walks out with you into that world so that you and I can walk anywhere we go on this globe and take every step that we take with a smile a mile wide. Because we can. We have reason to. Look at what Jesus has done for you and for me. To provide us with forgiveness, with an inheritance in heaven.
heaven. And yes, joy. Joy that we can be using right now. I know that the present circumstances of the pandemic are causing some of us to be anxious, fearful, yes, maybe even stressful. And those of you who aren't worried about this in the least, perhaps maybe are worried about or stressed about uh, what has just begun. I'm already sick of it. Talking about the aggravating presidential campaign that just started and, and is, already, is already sickening and maddening. There's a lot of things that you and I can focus on. A lot of things that can be stuck on our nose and, and, and cause us stink. And that's all we're going to think about. Aggravation, anxiety, fear. But you and I need to focus on the reason that we do have to be joyful. And that is that Jesus is our friend. And he continues to walk with us as our friend every step we go. The Holy Spirit wants you to encourage. Wants to encourage you to, to focus on that. Remember what he said? Rejoice as the Apostle Paul wrote. That's something you and I can do more of, can we? Yes, we have confidence in the forgiveness of sins. We are certain that we're going to be saved. Are we really as joyful as we can be as we walk in this world? As we reflect what Jesus has done for us as our friend, as our Savior, and our Lord to others? Can we be a little bit more joyful? I hope and I pray that you and I focus on what you and I have right now. Not what we will have in the future, but focus on what you and I have right now and are able to enjoy the joy of the blessings that you and I have. And one of those things is joy itself. So that your joy meter, your happiness date, whatever you could call it, won't be registering toward the bottom, but will be up towards the top every day, all day long. Amen. Let us arise and continue our worship by confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find that Creed in the front portion of Christian worship on page 41. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the house of Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We turn to the next page, page 42, with the prayer of the church. We join in that response of prayer of the church this morning. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you have given to us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth and displace the everywhere. Grant us the rich change of patience with this love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, cares of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air, and keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. You are those who are sick, cheer those who are sad, calm those who are distressed, and comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy 
of our gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessings to every nation on earth, where there are wars, may there be peace, where there is hatred, let it be healed, where there is poverty, danger, or injustice. Come with your almighty power to help us, Lord. And hear us, Lord as we bring you our private petitions. Finally, we bring all of these requests before you in the name and merit of Jesus our Savior, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son. If you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, keep me today also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. In your hands I commend my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one triune God, now and forever. reconciled to God by the death of our Savior Jesus Christ. And guess what? That makes us friends and family of the triune God. That makes us a brother of our Savior and you and I as brothers and sisters in Christ. So brothers and sisters in Christ, take the blessings that you've been given. Not just forgiveness. Not just the, the promise of eternal life. But the peace. The hope. And yes, even the joy of the blessings that you've been given through Christ. Take them with you. Take them out there every step you take. Let it show in every step you take as you live in harmony with each other. But above all, use that joy to serve your Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Thank you.